Prolo Lucifer, that's Lucilfer with an L, is one of the most enigmatic existences in all of the animes and the mangas, with occupation titles such as Thief, Thief Boss, Boss of Thieves, Floor Master of Heaven's Arena, and even known by some as the Red Cleaner, which conjures up all sorts of gory underworld images, but is actually a reference to Krollo's canonical voice acting career, which started at a young age, then took a rather bleak turn, and then whoops, he committed a genocide. Krollo is a complicated character to say the least, like properly complicated. In contrast, we often call characters like Hisoka complex, but compared to Krollo, he is boringly simple. Hisoka can be summed up as, horny clown wants to come, whereas Krollo can't be summarized. The interesting thing about Hisoka is that we know what he is, but we don't quite understand what made him that way. His history is mysterious, but Krollo is very much the opposite. We know his history quite extensively, and yet it really doesn't bring us much closer to actually understanding him. But let's give it a go. Krollo is from Meteor City. And despite its reputation, Krollo actually had a fairly happy childhood, up until a certain very unhappy, corpsey, traumatic friend killing point, but you know, we'll get to that. As a child, to entertain himself, he used to play in garbage with other future troop members. And one of their hobbies was finding discarded videotapes to watch in the city's dedicated AV room. And you never really knew what you were going to get here, but Krollo watched every tape, including up to 20 volumes of a series called Learning Gelman, a foreign language course. And so Krollo actually found enough of these tapes to become fluent in Gelman. Very handy because he would go on to find another extensive series of tapes in Gelman known as the Mighty Sweepin' Power Cleaners. And because Krollo spoke fluent Gelman now, he decided to translate the tape and have he and his friends dub the voices of the characters at live screenings. In the most innocent way possible, this was the formation of what would go on to become known as the Phantom Troop, with many of the troop's founding members given dub roles, including Finks, Nobunaga, Pakunoda, Sarasa, and Feitan. Who's Sarasa, you ask? Well, you're gonna regret asking that question. Also, this fictional hunter content is sponsored by Dungeon Hunter 6, the stunning fantasy unique hero collector ARPG with fast paced hack and slash combat to utilize against bosses, like really big bosses. It's absolutely free to play. You can download it now using the link in the description or you can scan the QR code on screen if you're viewing it on PC. And here's why you should, because in this game, killing bosses is not the end. No, 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 that's just the prologue to the story because you can then summon your conquered foes to become your squad members, make them follow you, perform perfect combo skills, and even shapeshift into them to harness the ultimate of powers. Speaking of, there's a lot of creative design in this game, like the customizable mount system, allowing you to ride a whole ton of fantasy creatures and all sorts of wacky machinery. Plus, Dungeon Hunter 6 takes graphics to a whole new level, with the most stunning and smoothest of animations on mobile devices, with a wide array of other features, such as playing with guildmates, a variety of skill tree options, and trading via the auction system. You can download the game for free on Android or iOS using my link in the description, or scan the QR code on screen if you're viewing it on a PC to get a free spell special starter pack worth $50 redos, including 10 summoning scrolls, one SSR Lieutenant Demonic Wolf, and an accessory pack. Plus, you can use your game account to enter the launch lucky spin event for free, with great prizes such as the iPhone 15 Pro Max, PlayStation 5s, Apple Watches, and even more starting on October 15th. So let's all thank Dungeon Hunter for sponsoring our addiction to fictional Hunter content. But for now, it's back to you, me. Sarasa was a girl who loved performing with her friends so much that she invested extra time into finding new tapes, all by herself. Herself. And one day she was abducted, tortured, and ultimately murdered in a forest. The whole affair having been filmed, and what remained of her body being hung up for her friends to find. A note was left with her remains, which was written in Gelman. However, its contents were so scarring that Krollo vowed never to translate it. Even going so far as to say, I'll never speak of it, even if you try to kill me. And from this moment on, Krollo changed. He became so consumed with finding Sarasa's killers that he developed a three year plan to morph what goodness remained of me to your city into a paradise for the worst humanity has to offer. The general idea was to create a bit of a safe space for criminals to screen their art, hoping that one day Sarasa's killers would come and screen their film. Basically, he wanted to build a Sundance for snuff films. And the rest of the children agreed to Krollo's plan, with one exception being Sheila. She's a very intriguing character as well, but one for a very different video. But feeling the same desire for vengeance, these Meteor City kidlets elected Krollo as their leader. And this was the informal founding of the Phantom Troop. Krollo then disappeared for three years to piece his plan together, and when he returned to Meteor City at the age of 14, he officially formed the Phantom Troop based on the structure of a spider. Krollo described the organization as follows. I'm the head and you're the legs. The legs do what the head says. There will be times when the legs are more important than the head. If I die, someone else will take over. My orders are of the utmost priority. 
My life is not. Be sure to make the right decision. I am only a part of the spider. What's important is the survival of the whole, not the individual. To which everyone else replied, Oh, hi, Crollo. Nice to see you too. What's it been? Yeah, three years? All right, yeah, let's let's do your spider thing. I am, of course, being a bit flippant here, but that is more or less how it happened. Crollo returned to Meteor City, and before he even said hi, he just started preaching. With everyone else just going, wait, is that Crollo? And should I be listening to what he's saying? But listen, they did. And to solidify this group, each member was given a spider tattoo with an accompanying number. But Crollo, you see, he was a very special boy and he was given the number zero. It's also unknown where Crollo's tattoo is or if indeed he actually has one. You'll sometimes hear it said on the internet that Crollo's tattoo was on his arm. And there is reason for this, as the 1999 anime is responsible because they made the decision to show the spider tattoo on his right arm. Weirdly enough though, they chose not to include the number. But in the manga, he has no such tattoo on his arm. To be fair, maybe it was on his left arm, Dunno, can't really see it because it got blown the F off. The most recent entry is the 2011 anime and they wanted nothing to do with this. They said, we don't care to weigh in on this controversy by censoring the blown off arm and even keeping both arms rather conservatively covered, neither confirming nor denying anything. When it comes to Crollo, he's one of the more inconsistent characters across the three different Hunter Hunters. Really, the only thing that all three series can agree on is that his hair is black, which is more than you can say for Hisoka. In the 1999 anime, his hair is blue, 2011 is scarlet, and in the manga, it's bright orange. Whatever the case, Crollo's plan worked. Meteor City underwent something of a dark renaissance, and became a hot spot for many of the world's sickest minds. There's no way to tell how many snuff films Crollo watched, tens, hundreds, maybe thousands. And to this day, we don't actually know if the troop found Saras's tape or her killers for that matter. It's likely they did because the focus of the troop these days has nothing to do with Sarasa or the, how shall we say, film industry as a whole. There's probably a better way to say that. What's like a, like a really dark term for Hollywood? Like a Hollywood, but it's run by horrible people. Actually, you know what? Hollywood still works. However, after the lengths that Crollo went to in order to take revenge, he arguably became just as bad, if not worse than Sarasa's killers, which is very much epitomized through the most notable troop action in the series being the Kurta Massacre, where the Phantom Troop reportedly tortured the children of the clan before gouging out their scarlet eyes to ensure the most vibrant of reds, which would sell for the highest of prices. I'd say at least they didn't film it, but we don't know that. I'm sure those particular movie films would have sold for quite a bit in this world. But with that and also other non-genocide based actions, Crollo and the Phantom Troop became infamous worldwide criminals with class A bounties, the highest available. Although their bounty amounts have never been disclosed, which has caused fans to turn to giving them terribly calculated One Piece bounties. But Crollo was able to do all of this because of his exceptional Nen abilities, which was interesting because it's unknown exactly when and how Crollo learned Nen. The first confirmed Nen user in the Phantom Troop is Machi, who was able to see the aura of Renko. And this may have been a gate way for all of the triplets. However, Crollo may have also learned this elsewhere during his three years away. Whatever the case, Crollo is a specialist whose heart suit reflects his spider philosophy. There is one head and many legs. His ability skill hunter is designed to acquire the legs of others, and by legs, I mean the nan abilities. Many, many legs, all used by one head. And so Crollo is actually the owner of the most nan abilities in the series to date, including his two original heart suit, skill hunter and double face. Crollo has used 11 hearts when hunter hunter and almost certainly has access to far more. He's a bit of a Nen multi-tool and best known in Hunter x Hunter for his intellect because Crollo always uses these abilities in the most perfect and precise manner. So perhaps unsurprisingly, in terms of physical strength, Crollo is actually quite lacking compared to the rest of the troop. Crollo ranks in seventh place in their arm wrestling contests, meaning that his strength is even outclassed by Machi who sits in sixth place. This doesn't mean that Crollo is physically weak by any means though. He is still a world-class fight battling man. So much so that historically, he is one of the few people able to fight a fully fledged Zoldic assassin and live. Prior to the beginning of Hunter x Hunter, Crollo had an altercation with one Silver Zoldic where both of them managed to survive. That, that right there is already a miracle. For most people who engage with a Zoldic assassin, it is the very last choice they ever make. But mate, this, this Crollo guy, he then had the balls to fight two Zoldics at the same time. During York New City, both Zeno and Silver Zoldic were hired by the Ten Dons to kill Crollo. And on this second occasion, he almost certainly would have been killed if not for a bout of cleverness. You see, Crollo, being very good at brain thinking, hired his own set of Zoldics to kill the Ten Dons. And when they died, the contract on his head expired. All Crollo had to do was survive long enough for a contract to be terminated, which he did, but why did he do what he did? And why would he go on to do what he does? Even with Crollo's power and intelligence, his motives 
are still pretty unclear. Frollo himself even admits this in chapter 111. I don't like to talk about my motives, which uh, is fair enough, I guess. I will say that most of his plans revolve around acquiring rare items for the troop to sell for some sweet, sweet cash money. But what becomes of said sweet cash monies are a mystery. A lot of it may get sent back to Meteor City because the troop do protect it, or perhaps it's all funding for a much larger project. Or maybe Krollo needs to keep making money in order to save himself from being brutally kill murdered by Zoldix. The average going rate for a Zoldix assassination is a billion Jenny ahead. So Krollo had to fork over at least 10 billion Jenny just to keep himself alive during York New. But also maybe it's not about the money at all. Not counting the Kurta clan, which, which is a big thing to discount, but just go with me for a second. Not counting them, Krollo operates mostly within the underworld. His two major targets in Hunter x Hunter thus far have been the 10 Dons of York New City and the Kakin Empire both of whom are wildly corrupt entities that indulge in the height of human atrocity. For example, Neon Nestrade, a mafia boss's daughter, was also a body part collector. And her father, Light Nestrade, also had an appreciation for the arts. He even made his own art that one time when he killed, framed, and hung one of his own bodyguards on the wall. Meanwhile, Fourth Prince Reinick is a renowned appreciator of sickening art, and this disregard for human life for the sake of art, collectibles, or entertainment is exactly the attitude that led to Saras's murder. So it would make sense that Krollo would target these entities. Especially when, if all you wanted to do was make money, there are far easier targets. Like say, Batera. That dude was a multi-billionaire, rich enough to buy almost every copy of Greed Island, with pretty pathetic security as well. He would be such an easy mark for the troop to rob or blackmail. But then again, all the guy wanted to do was find a cure for the love of his life. He wasn't interested in the darker doors that wealth can open. And so the Phantom Troop weren't interested in him. Krollo's hardly a punisher. Though. Even forgetting about the Kurta clan, which again, another big thing to forget about, but even doing that, Krollo's actions still end up killing a lot of arguably innocent people. Even prompting Gon to ask, how can you kill people who have nothing to do with you? And in response to this, firstly, Krollo is drawn with a rare burst of emotion. Krollo is almost always portrayed with a neutral expression, even in the midst of battle. But here, what Gon said struck a nerve, a big sarasa shaped nerve. In this moment, what Krollo sees is his young self confronting Saras's killers, asking them, how could you do this to someone who has nothing to do with you? And now all of these years down the line, Krollo is on the other side. And what's worse is that he may now legitimately be able to empathize with Saras's killers. Krollo's chilling reply to Gon is, I don't know. It might be because they have nothing to do with me. So at this point in his life, Krollo seems to have abandoned forging new connections. Everyone he actually cares about is a childhood friend. He's even cold and distant to newer members of the Phantom Troop. Characters like Shizuku and Benolanov who joined at later dates. And personally, I don't think Krollo is quite sure of the answer to that question himself. He has a lot of trouble explaining his actions to Gon. And yeah, Krollo is one of the most intelligent people in the world, but that doesn't mean he always has some sort of grand plan. Not everything is a game of 12D spider chest. And Krollo himself could very much just be lost. His motivation was to bring justice to Saras's murder. But in that quest, he has now committed countless Saras's. So where do you even go from there? or how do you justify your own actions? Krollo's solution to this appears to become so disconnected from humanity that he's not even sure why he does anything. For example, in his fight against Isoka, Krollo says one of the more interesting lines, which is, humans are so very interesting. He says this in response to Hisoka being so determined to fight him. Despite that from Krollo's perspective, his victory was 100% guaranteed. Despite that, Hisoka still wanted to do it. So there's this distinct separation, like Krollo is now an alien observing the human race. And Hisoka is a great foil for Krollo because they're such opposites. Krollo feels nothing when killing, whereas Hisoka kills in order to feel. And the closer he is to death, the more intense the feeling. These are two figures who could never understand each other. Or could they? Because after reviving, Hisoka made it his mission to kill each and every member of the Phantom Troop. And with each murdered member, Hisoka is gradually severing all of Krollo's remaining connections to humanity. But also at the same time, inspiring Krollo to want to kill someone someone to feel for the first time since Sarasa. But just how many more troop members is this going to cost? And ultimately, what will Krollo's life have accomplished?